You know, sometimes you just got to talk about that. So let's talk about that at Sunday School. Hello, I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor for Sunday School. Well, thank you for joining us for this new series on the General Councils of the Church. Before we begin, if you would do us a favor, look down below and bless that like button. It would help us out greatly. Subscribe to the channel and share these videos on Facebook or Twitter so that other people can learn about these subject matters. Before we begin, also, we want to have a moment of prayer. I invite you to join with me the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and then from the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the 2019 version, the Collect Number 2 for the Universal Church, which was composed by William Laud. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now, collect number two for the Universal Church. Let us pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech thee for thy holy Catholic Church, that thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth, in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, we're going to go through a study of the general councils of the church. And basically, this is a church history study, but it's also a doctrinal study, getting us familiar with the basic dogmatic statements of the faith that have been made and the refutation of various heresies down through the years. And so it's, it's also a tool for discernment about being able to identify the true teaching and spot out and root out the false teaching. As we go along, our main resource is going to be John L. Murray's book called The General Councils of the Church. And then we'll also add in additional resources here and there. We'll look at those universally accepted councils, those big first seven, and we'll look at all the big councils of the church uh, that continued in the Western church down through the years. And uh, we'll come back in a moment with a consideration of what is a general council. God's strength, not man's, has preserved the church for nearly 2,000 years, linking it to the apostolic faith of the primitive Christian community. And so the history of the Catholic Church then is really a spiritual history, the account of how the Holy Spirit has sustained it through the centuries, of how in his own manner he has enabled it to withstand persecutions from without and doctrinal errors that have threatened it from within. The problems the church has faced in the past 2,000 years would have ruined any purely human organization, and yet the church remains. There's been growth and development, non-essential changes, certainly, but the faith, the sacraments, these have remained untouched. The power of the Holy Spirit is who we can thank for that, who has helped us triumph over those trials of our history. And the study of the councils is, in fact, a study of the church's history, a history of her doctrinal and disciplinary problems that have beset her down the years. The councils stand out as high points in her, in her history, as true Christian landmarks, serving as guides for the future. The influence of these general councils has 
possibly been felt more with the passing of time than it was at the moment of its solemn deliberations and closing. The influence of such a council, then, is never fully felt in a day or a month or even years, but it's recognized in hindsight as a special force in the life of the Church. The secret behind this special force of a general council is the Holy Spirit. It is above any other ecclesiastical meeting, a particularly profound and solemn expression of the guidance of that spirit of truth which Christ promised to send upon his church. John 14, 15 through 17, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so a general council is a part of the mystery of the church. Like all the varied elements within the church, it also shares in the supernatural quality of that life. The church has recognized certain councils as ecumenical. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The decrees of these gatherings have played a very special and important role in the life of Christian people. If we, and this is John Murphy's literal definition here, if John Murphy were to define it, our definition would run something like this, quote, a general council is a legitimate gathering of the bishops of the entire world called for the purpose of discussing and settling the doctrinal and disciplinary questions of the universal church. Well, the bishops of the world and the Roman pontiff formed together what we call the College of Bishops. That's not where they went to college. That's just what they are, a group, and they act and speak together. The Pope may show his approval, his part, in any number of ways by solemnly calling the council, by addressing official letter to the group, or by sending his delegates to attend, or even just by ratifying um, after the fact, signifying his approval at the completion of the discussions. In, in any case, no final decree of a council is considered binding, at least under his jurisdiction, unless the Roman pontiff approves of that final form. And in fact, even in the Second Vatican Council, we saw Pope Paul VI make subtle changes. So he would replace a, a word or a phrase here or there to tweak it and make it um, conform to his final approval. So that's, that's how the Pope plays his part in the history of the councils. Now I want to turn to some Anglican resources um, for further explanation. This is uh, volume two of Francis J. Hall's book or, or series called Dogmatic Theology. Uh, sometimes it's been referred to as the Anglican Summa uh, because of its prominence and uh, extensiveness and uh, importance. This is volume two. And this chapter is, and the volume two is about authority in the church, and this chapter is on councils and popes. So beginning on page 132, he says, General councils constitute important machinery which the episcopate, or bishops, has employed in certain extraordinary emergencies in order to set forth ecumenical definitions of the church's traditional teaching on points obscured or denied by heretics. As extraordinary bodies, the authority of these councils depends upon their success in defining the church's real mind and upon their acceptance by the church at large. The fact of their meeting creates a presumption that they will be guided by the Holy Spirit in their delib deliberations and decisions, which may not be rejected by mere private judgment or until it becomes clear that the church herself does not accept them. But general councils are not infallible in and of themselves. And that may strike some as odd when Hall says this, but think of it this way. Just because you put ecumenical council on the letterhead of the invitation doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be an ecumenical council. Uh, that might be more up to God than up to the typist. So he elaborates, the infallibility of the church 
resides in the whole Catholic body. Basically, what we're saying when we talked about the infallibility of the church is the indefectibility of the church, that the church as a whole will never go astray, Christianity will never die out. This is part of Jesus' promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And when it comes down to who has the final word and the final say, that statement cannot be wrong. Otherwise, the gates of hell would prevail against it. So he says the infallibility of the church resides in the whole Catholic body, and no assembly of men, whatever, may impose its decisions upon the faithful independently of their subsequent acceptance by that church. As a matter of fact, general councils have sometimes failed to achieve the end for which they were summoned, and have even committed themselves to heresy. And he has a footnote talking about the Council of Arminium, uh, A.D. 359, um, which basically succumbed to Arianism. That of Ephesus, not the one you probably heard of, but another one in 449, um, approved of the Eutychian heresy. And these were supposed to be called as general councils, and um, they were widely represented. They, On paper, everything looked right, but yet they fell short. They erred. Something went wrong. And then he talks a little bit later about the distinction between a general and an ecumenical council. Now, this is not something that everyone makes as a distinction. Usually, the big distinction is between an ecumenical, general, worldwide council and a local council. And so a local council would hander, handle local matters, although it may address issues that pertain to a, a worldwide significance, some doctrinal issue. And of course, it always has to conform to that worldwide doctrinal standard. You can't have different doctrines in different places, but you can have different practices, different disciplines, different laws, different rules and regulations in different places because you have particular problems in particular places. But here he's talking about a distinction, making a distinction between a general council or universal council and an ecumenical council. So listen to what he says. A general council is one in which the church militant as a whole is represented externally and pro forma. That is, that it is to represent universally the church. So those invitations went out to all the bishops, and they may not have all been able to respond, and there may have been, you know, some places like in, in China where the, the local government is uh, oppressive, uh, or Iran or something like that, where they couldn't make it and they couldn't attend. But as far as the design, it was general or universal in design. But an ecumenical council, and it comes from the word mean, meaning to the whole world. An ecumenical council is one, whether general or otherwise, because he points out Constantinople in 381 was entirely Eastern. It was basically a local council that was adopted as general and universal and ecumenical after the fact. So he says an ecumenical council is one, whether general or otherwise, which has been received by the whole church militant as rightly defining the church's teaching. In other words, the Christian world says, yeah, that speaks for us. That may take some time. And so an ecumenical council is said to be infallible. The meaning is that acceptance of the council by the church proves that it in fact has not erred. Because going back to that idea of indefectibility, the whole church cannot be led astray so that Christianity dies out and the gates of hell, of, of hell prevail against it. And so he says, this is the practical meaning of the church's infallibility, that she can never cease to be the home of saving truth and the ark of safety for truth-seeking souls, which I think is a wonderful description of infallibility. Well, let's put some excerpts on the screen. The first one is from the 39 Articles of Religion. This is number 21, addressing the authority of general councils. Now, as far as councils being received, the articles don't really say anything about that, but they do address one issue of councils being called, 
And this is basically because these articles were being composed during the sessions of the Council of Trent. And so basically, when you read this article, you should have in mind that what they're thinking of here is talking about Trent. And so it says, General councils may not be gathered together without the commandment and will of princes. And so in other words, the sovereign of England, although invited, and the bishops of England were invited, the sovereign objected. And so this first line is pointing out that it can't really be general unless the sovereigns approve, unless the uh, government approves. And when they be gathered together, for as much as they be an assembly of men, whereof all be not governed with the Spirit and Word of God, they may err, and sometimes have erred, uh, as we got a list earlier from uh, Father Hall, even in things pertaining unto God, wherefore things ordained by them as necessary to salvation have neither strength nor authority, unless it may be declared that they be taken out of Holy Scripture. And so that's something that we find uh, that with the articles and other Anglican divines uh, have stressed many times that only truths proclaimed by the Bible or consistent uh, and proved by the Bible can be held as binding as necessary for salvation. And so the councils, much like the creeds, derive their authority from revelation, from the sacred tradition recorded in the Bible, since biblical truth is what they are designed to articulate. And some councils were able to do that, and we call them ecumenical councils. And some councils were not able to do that, and they messed up pretty badly, and we call them robber councils. Another statement, the Jerusalem Declaration, this is from the, I think, the first GAFCON meeting, in any case it is the one in 2008, uh, had a list of various um, affirmations, and this is one of them, number three. We uphold the four ecumenical councils and the three historic creeds as expressing the rule of faith of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So here they make a reference to the four ecumenical councils. Which four? Well, the first four. And why the first four? Because these were the ones that articulated the various subtleties and distinctions and doctrinal issues about the person and work of Christ, above all, and also the Holy Spirit and a few other things. But primarily because they're the ones that spell out what it is that we're talking about when we say we believe in Jesus Christ, that He's consubstantial with the Father, that He is one person with two natures, and so on. And so that's why they specify the four ecumenical councils. And this is not to say that we reject all the rest of them. It's just saying that these four, like those historic creeds, lay out the basics. Let's look at another one, the Fundamental Declarations of the Anglican Church in North America. So this passage touches on the councils concerning the seven councils of the undivided church, that is, those that were affirmed and participated with by East and West before the division between East and West. Concerning the seven councils of the undivided church, we affirm the teaching of the first four councils and the Christological clarifications of the fifth, sixth, and seventh councils insofar as they are agreeable to the Holy Scriptures. And so again, much like we mentioned before, the idea is that the role of the council is to articulate biblical truth, and it is from divine revelation that they receive their authority. When Christ walked the earth with his disciples, preaching to the people, he unfolded clearly for the first time the sublime mystery of the Trinity and the truths of the Gospel. It was the mystery of Christ Himself, God the Son, come down from heaven among men, come to save them from their sin. It was to be the work of the Church on earth to continue the work of Christ after His ascension. Aided by His Holy Spirit, it was to keep alive and unchanged the truth unveiled by God. 
acting as his instrument, it was to share in the work of applying to the souls of men the graces won for them upon Calvary's cross. For this reason, the history of the church is really the history of Christ, Christ in his fullness, in his mystical body, the church. That's why Luke's sequel to his gospel is the Acts of the Apostles, the story of Christ continuing to minister through his mystical body, the church. The early years of that church history were troubled years. They were dominated by two chief concerns. There were, on the one hand, the recurring persecutions that came from without, and on the other hand, there were those doctrinal errors and controversies that came from within. The doctrinal battles had to be carried on while men and women who believe in Christ pass through the terrors of persecution. This was the special cross of those first few centuries. The persecutions were not continual, relentless persecution of the followers of Christ. They were more periodic, interspaced with years of relative peace. But they did keep returning again and again until the end of the third century. In the background of these persecutions, especially in the years of peace, the church continued to grow, became more definitely organized, and set forth its doctrine with ever-increasing clarity. The first persecution broke out very soon after the death of Christ in Jerusalem itself. It was this that first helped the faith to spread to other parts of the known world because the Christians very often had to flee, had to leave Jerusalem. This persecution under Agrippa must have begun about the year 36, and that brought the church its first martyr, St. Stephen. This, however, was only a faint echo of the two particularly fierce persecutions which marked that first century. The Roman emperors also turned their hatred against the Christians. First, there was the persecution of Nero from about the year 64 to 67, and then after 25 years of relative peace, that of the Emperor Domitian in the year 95. Yet these two trials were only the beginning. In the next century, Rome continued to persecute the followers of Christ, although with one crucial difference. In the second century, the emperors paid more attention to the legal requirements for condemning Christians. This was actually, we might say, the first step toward a change in official attitude. Thus, while these later emperors were not exactly friends of the church, their attitude was different enough that Tertullian could write that only Nero and Domitian were enemies of the Christians in a personal way. Nevertheless, the perse persecutions did continue. St. Clement of Rome and St. Ignatius of Antioch died under Trajan at the beginning of the second century. The emperors Hadrian, Antoninus, and Marcus Aurelius all continued to bring Christians to trial and to punish them with death. St. Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, died under Antoninus in 156. The church at Lyon was all but blotted out under Marcus Aurelius, only to rise again under the direction of a new bishop, St. Irenaeus. The first real help came from the worst of the Roman emperors, the worst from the Roman point of view. Commodus, who reigned from 180 to 192, just wasn't very interested in enforcing Roman law, and the Christians benefited from that. It was still against the law to be a Christian, but the state under Commodus just wasn't really concerned. With the death of Commodus, though, matters took on a different tone. Under Septimus Severus, 193 to 211, the state began to take the initiative in bringing Christians to trial. Formerly, the state had kind of held back and waited for denunciations to come in from the people. In practice, however, this change resulted in even more sporadic persecutions. They arose far more suddenly at the will of the emperor, and they were in some ways more violent. Eventually, they died out one by one, having spent their force with no lasting effect. Septimus Severus failed in his attempt to slow down the progress of Christianity. In fact, he may have added to its speed. Nor did the bloody persecutions of Maximin in 235 to 238, brief though it was, that didn't meet with any greater success. The Christian church remained 
and was here to stay. In the middle of the third century, with the coming of Decius, the emperor in 249, we came upon the last and most violent persecutions of the century. This general persecution aimed at stamping out the Christians once and for all. During this period, very large numbers of Christians apostatized. They, they chickened out. The persecution was waged on all sides, at Rome, in Africa, in Gaul, in Spain, in Asia. Christian died by the hundreds. Gallus succeeded Decius in 251 and renewed the persecution. Valerian, the successor of Gallus, continued this policy soon after he became emperor in 253. It was only after his death in 260 that it appeared the trials were over, but the appearances were a little deceptive. After nearly 20 years of peace, Diocletian was instigated by Galerius to undertake what was to be the final persecution of the Christians around the year 303. A period of violence followed with many deaths, but Christianity was to triumph in the end. The bloody purge was finally called off in the year 311 by Constantine, Licinius, and Galerius, one of the very men who had moved Diocletian to begin the persecution in the first place. And it was now stated officially, even though begrudgingly, but officially that it is permissible, legal, to be a Christian. Church property was restored. Religious assemblies were allowed. And then the final and lasting peace came with the famous Edict of Milan in the year 313, also called the Peace of Constantine. It marks the dividing point in the history of the early church and brings with it a new story about the first general council of Nicaea. But before we go there, let's go back to Jerusalem. Well, as we noted before, the doctrinal battles went on within the church during that same time of external trials. Before St. Paul died, he wrote a letter to his disciple, St. Timothy, summing up the Christian teaching by saying, 2 Timothy 2.8, quote, Remember that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and was descended from David. This is my gospel in which I suffer, even to bonds, as a criminal. These two points were the extremes which had been joined together in Christ. He is a true man, descended from David, as Paul said, but he is also God, since he rose from the dead just as he had foretold. The whole doctrinal story of the early church is a defense of those two points against those who would overemphasize one point at the expense of another. Even before the first century had drawn to a close, there were those who had begun to challenge this central thought of Christianity. For different reasons, they had begun to deny especially that Christ was true God. When St. John wrote the fourth gospel toward the end of the first century, he clearly had these people in mind. He explains this as the very reason why he wrote the gospel. John 20, verse 31, he says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. There were also some men who denied that Christ was the Messiah, the Christ. These were especially the early Christians who belonged to the so-called Judaizing party. They wished to hold fast to the practices of the old Jewish law, and they realized there was in the teaching of Christ a certain rejection of at least part of this law. In rejecting him as the Messiah, however, they also rejected him as God. The prototype of the General Council met to address this issue in Jerusalem in the year 50 AD. Peter himself had his eyes opened to the universal mission of the gospel and personally baptized the first Gentile convert, Cornelius, in Acts chapter 10. In response to divine revelation, Peter announced that when it comes to Jew versus Gentile, quote, truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, Acts 10, 34. Now later on in Acts chapter 22, St. Paul would be commissioned as a missionary apostle 
specifically to the Gentile world. But first the details had to be ironed out, and the chief source of contention was this relationship between the Torah and the Gospel. Did a Gentile convert have to become a Jew first in order to become a Christian? Some were falsely teaching that one did have to become a Jew first, that is, basically, be circumcised. Well, the matter was considered by a council in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 50, sorry, Acts chapter 15. James, the bishop of Jerusalem, presided over the council. St. Peter spoke in favor of baptizing the Gentiles without any requirement of circumcision. Barnabas and Paul reported on their success of their mission to the Gentiles. And so an agreement was reached, and St. James proclaimed the verdict, and they composed a letter to carry the decision, specifying, quote, It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you, that is, the Gentiles, no greater burden than these necessary things. And then there's a little list. Number one, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from unchastity. Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. And so with this decision, the apostles determined that Gentile converts did not have to become Jews first, but on the other hand, they were still obligated to keep the laws of Noah that were binding on all humanity. Well, what about the Greeks? At the same time, the other Christians of the first century came into contact with Greek systems of philosophy that taught that material things were evil in themselves. They believed in Christ, but they came to deny that he was true man because of those presuppositions. Because of these other ideas, they felt they had to deny at once that Christ ever possessed a real physical body. To them, it seemed impossible that the all-holy God could take on something as corrupt and evil as material, physical flesh. St. Ignatius of Antioch, put to death at the beginning of the second century, was greatly concerned with those who denied that Christ possessed a true human nature. On his journey to Rome, where he was to die, he wrote seven letters to different churches. In them, he mentions the error of these men. We now refer to them as docetists, from the Greek word which means to seem or to appear. They claim that Christ only seemed to have a body like ours, only appeared to have human flesh. In actuality, he did not, they, they argued. Hence, Ignatius wrote, Be deaf, then, to any talk that ignores Jesus Christ of David's lineage of Mary, who was really born, ate, and drank, and was really persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was really crucified and died in the sight of heaven and earth and the underworld. He was really raised from the dead, for his father raised him, just as his father will raise us. It is not as some unbelievers say that his passion was a sham. It is they who are a sham. Yes, and their fate will fit their fancies, they will be ghosts and apparitions. Well, the men of this period eventually began to speak of the Trinity by using terms that differ from those in the Scriptures. This, of course, was something that basically had to happen. It was inevitable that different terminology would be employed as the Gospel crossed the barrier of culture and language and so on. The doctrinal history of the church is a continuation of this process. What has been said in the graphic speech of Scripture must come to be expressed in more technical terms to satisfy the needs of the inquiring mind of man and to answer the objections of various heretics, to get down to a specificity of meaning. This just could not be avoided. But when man attempts to explain in any way the content of revealed truth, there's the grave danger that he's going to distort it. He has presuppositions. He has a lens through which he views things. He's liable to see things in terms 
that he already understands and reinterpret them. And so he may all too easily put his ideas into the words of Scripture. That's what we call eisegesis, reading things into the text, and give them an entirely new meaning. Ultimately, the only proper teaching authority in the church can give those kinds of final answers on these hotly debated topics. And so this is the task of the popes and the bishops and the general councils down through the ages to single out what is a valid clarification of scriptural terminology from what is an erroneous one. Without the guarantee of an infallible guide in this matter with the church, Christian truth would soon be lost in a kind of maze of contrary opinions. In fact, that's what heresy really is, opinionism. Yet we need not believe that the opinion of any mere man, no matter how wise or how saintly he may be, is obligated to be taken as gospel, we're obliged to accept on faith only the word of God and nothing more. And for this reason, God continues to, we might say, speak through his church, as he promised that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. He makes use of those to whom he is entrusted with the sacred office of teaching, the bishops, that is their specific task to guard and teach the faith. They speak not on their own authority, but on God's, and we accept not their opinion, but the truth testified by the authority of God speaking through them. Thus, in these early years, we see the need of stating the very same truth of Scripture, but by expressing it in different words. In that way, the Church comes to understand revealed truth more clearly, more precisely. Perhaps the first great impulse toward this process came from those Gnostics. That word gnosis means knowledge, and these were the ones, at least in their own eyes, who were considered the wise ones, who claimed to understand life properly. There were pagan Gnostics before the time of Christ. Thus, Gnosticism did not develop from Christianity, but there was a Christianity uh, that was imbued with Gnosticism, a Gnostic Christianity, a divergent form of Christianity. When some of these men came into contact with Christian truth, they attempted to join these two things together. Frequently, that meant they fell into error. Their fundamental belief that matter is evil was the basis of the error of docetism, into which some of them fell, the belief that Christ had no true physical body, he only appeared to be human. The Gnostics also thought of God as someone from whom there came forth kind of sparks of some kind of emanations, they called them, divine sparks. This notion was to confuse the Christians of later centuries when they came to describe the relationship of the second person of the Trinity to the Father, the first person of the Trinity. In fact, the general Gnostic notions will occasionally appear in our doctrinal history for many centuries. Gnosticism developed many varied forms, so that it's really impossible to reduce them all to one specific system. It's kind of a family of ideas. But the general tendencies are clear whenever they do appear. As a result, the early defenders of the faith were especially concerned with these Gnostic and other similar kinds of errors. In regard to the explanation of Christian faith in the third century, two men particularly stand out. Tertullian and Origen. These two had a tremendous effect on the technical vocabulary which the church was developing. Tertullian, mostly in Latin, and Origen affected Greek. New words had to be coined to express the truths of the Christian faith in something beyond the words of Scripture, and they helped lead the way. By departing from the gra graphic terms of Scripture, however, they were taking a certain risk, and eventually they both fell into different doctrinal errors themselves. Tertullian even left the church and joined another group known as the Montanist, a group of Christians who desired to lead extremely devout lives, but who fell into error since they felt that they alone were being guided by the Holy Spirit. They were kind of the super church in their own eyes, or the real, real church. The church itself 
in the wide sense, had supposedly fallen into heresy. In the third century, however, new errors began to arise, errors that can be identified in special ways. They were actually preparing the way for the heresy of the early church. The names of two men stand out in this early period, the period of errors, Sibelius and Paul of Samosota. Sibelius was a priest of Libya who taught chiefly at Rome. He attempted to explain the Trinity in a very novel fashion. He admitted only um, a substance. Thus he claimed whenever we speak of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we really only are calling the one divine person by three different names, depending on how God is manifesting himself to the church. Sibelius has the dubious honor given to others throughout the centuries of having this general error named after him, so we call it Sibelianism, although most people recognize it as what's called modalism, God appearing in different modes, which is slightly different, but the same basic idea. The modern-day modalist who's most famous is T.D. Jakes, although he denies the charge. But you can see the attractiveness, the temptation of this simple solution. God is all the same. He just appears different to different people at different times. There were, however, other men who had similar teachings and other names. One group was known uh, that logically concluded that there was only a difference in names, and it was really the Father who suffered on the cross. So they were known as the Patri Passionists, and that name comes from Patri, or Father, and Passion, and Suffer, the idea that it was the Father who really suffered on the cross. Paul of Samosota was the Bishop of Antioch, and an important name in history, since he was a friend of Lucian, who was the teacher of Arius. Paul of Samosota taught things very much like Sibelius, but he attempted to explain the teaching in a more scientific fashion. His starting place was God as an intelligent being. God has intelligence, and therefore he can utter a divine word. This word he called by the Greek name logos. You're probably familiar with that, which means the same thing, logos, word. In the beginning was the logos, in the beginning was the word. For Paul, however, Paul of Samosota, this was not a person at all. It was only a manner in which God manifested his power. It was a divine emanation, I guess you'd say. As a result, when Paul of Samosota came to speak of Christ, he claimed that Christ was only a man, a mere man, nothing more. He was not God. We might call him the adopted Son of God, but for Paul that meant only one thing. This power of God, the Logos, kind of uh, took possession of Jesus, overshadowed him, dwelt within him as uh, a shell or a temple. In this teaching, it's not really, the Logos is not distinct from God. It is simply an impersonal power of God. Thus, the Logos was not a divine person. Paul of Samosota expressed this by saying that God and the Logos were of one substance. In saying this, he used the most important word in the history of the church, but he used it with his own meaning, a different meaning than it will be used later on. As Paul of Samosota used it, it meant that there was no trinity of persons at all, no Father or Son or oh, forget the Holy Spirit. There was simply an attribute or power of God, and it all belonged to the same thing, kind of like modalism, but a little bit different, different shade. And so in this, he was very much like Sibelius. To this, however, Paul of Samosota added another idea the notion of the coming to dwell in Jesus of Nazareth, the Logos becoming flesh. And in this way, he was helping to prepare for this big debate that would take place at the Council of Nicaea, for Arius was to develop his own thought in his own way. And so we've set the stage for next time when we'll talk about the Council of Nicaea. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you will continue to join us for this series, 
And if you are in Dallas, I invite you to come by and join us in person for worship. You can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Oh,